Well, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. And um, we're kind of going out in our um, scope from um, Oklahoma, the Oklahoma Water Survey, um, Jason, um, Yang, looking at Oklahoma and beyond the United States and even globally. And now we'll have a uh, more uh, global-centric uh, focus and uh, water and water where the capitalization is water technologies for emerging regions, water and sanitation for all. And so our focus is on developing countries uh, where the things we take for granted in Ken Comiskey, where's Ken? Ken, raise your hand. Ken, we should all thank Ken for the safe drinking water we enjoy here in Norman and many others in the room as well. And this is um, something that um, we often take for granted that's not uh, true in other parts of the world. So historically, and um, speaking to the choir here, preaching to the choir, what pathway has caused deaths due to cholera, typhoid fever in the 1800s and cryptosporidium in the 1990s? Water. The British Medical Society did a survey and of their uh, British medical professionals and asked what medical advance has saved more lives than any other medical advance in the last 160 years. And you might guess what the answer is, water. And so here's the Broad Street well in London, um, the site of a cholera epidemic. Uh, here's um, Chicago, uh, the water tower, and major typhoid fever outbreak large portions of the populations of London and Chicago died due to waterborne disease uh, in those time periods. So there's two billion, according to the uh, WHO Joint Monitoring Program, uh, upwards of two billion people that lack safe, reliable drinking water. Four billion people in the world. We're talking about a, a third to approach a half of the people in the world. Um, 700 deaths a year, a child every 45 seconds. And you couple that with the fact that 1.2 billion people live on less than a dollar per day. And these are the people that have the greatest need, but the <coughs> least resources to access what we take for. It's unfortunate that the poorest people in the world end up paying the most for water because they don't have a city like Norman to provide them the uh, infrastructure for less expensive water. So here's a nice little graph I like of the bottom billion trying to climb out. And if you need water and sanitation so you can be healthy, so you can go to school and get educated, so you can participate in the economy and have a better economic situation, so you can climb out of poverty and, and um, ideally um, promote world peace. And this is a young girl in a remote village in China who was um, on this pathway. So the National Academy of Engineering identified these um, grand challenges, and one of them was water. The United Nations established 17 sustainable development goals. One of them is water. And if you look at hunger, health, quality education, gender equality, and many of these, water, water and sanitation are greatly important to achieving many of these other goals. And so that led to the establishment of the OU Water Center, Water Technologies for Emerging Regions. And we have um, three pillars, we say. Uh, we have our undergraduate water miner and our Sooners Without Borders organization. We have our graduate research and we have a biennial water conference and water prize um, process. And so here we see a little bit about our undergraduate water miner and we have a number of these students. If you're not a water miner, raise your hand. Um, you have them out working, Jason. Um, I, so. <laughs> I saw a number of them outside earlier. Um, our Sooners Without Borders groups uh, here they're doing hands-on learning, and Jim Chamberlain, where's Jim? Raise your hand. Um, it teaches the students how to do these things here in Norman before they go out and do their internships in country. Um, and so here's a little bit about the education, the water miner, core courses, electives, and a Peace Corps prep. We have a number of our students going into the Peace Corps to get their experience and then determining whether to make that a career um, pathway for them. Uh, Sooners Without Borders, and we have students working in El Salvador, Dominican Republic, Bolivia, India, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Uganda, Cote d'Ivoire, as well as other countries. And so we're very proud of our undergraduate students, the water miner, they take courses, they do an in-country internship, and they learn about not only technology, but they learn about technology, cultural, behavioral, and um, financial sustainability. And so they have to take courses. Uh, if you're an engineer, they have to take courses in anthropology, sociology, business, entrepreneurship. Uh, if, uh, the anthropologists need to take courses in the other areas, and so our students get a 
cross-section of experience to what we see as important elements to sustainability. In our research, uh, we say water security, quantity, quality, and equity, building on our Oklahoma strengths. And so here Yang talked about water um, resources, climate change, and here's a graph of uh, precipitation in Oklahoma over the past century. We see drought years, wet years, and you might notice we've been more wet than drought recently, so we probably ought to prepare ourselves for the fact there may be future drought years ahead. My colleague Bob Nairn, uh, Bob, raise your hand, um, does work with uh, water quality on mine impacted waters in the northeast part of the state, but also does work in Bolivia with uh, water impacted resources there and people using the water to grow crops and they're getting metal poisoning from the food they're eating because of the remnants, the uh, legacy of the mining, uh, which was a major force in Bolivia. And then my work deals with arsenic and fluoride. We understand that right here in Norman, Oklahoma. And uh, it's a big issue in other parts of the world. And so here's just looking at arsenic. So here's a map showing uh, arsenic impacted regions of the world. And we see right here in central Oklahoma, we're highlighted as in um, India, Bangladesh, Cambodia, where we've worked, and other parts of the world. And so here, Ken Comiskey will recognize this picture. Actually, this looks new at this time when it was newly installed. And this is um, a system right here in Norman, Oklahoma, where we're using a bay oxide material to help remove an iron oxyhydroxide uh, type material to remove the arsenic from the water. We have to lower the pH to get it in the right pH range and then remove the arsenic. And this has proven very effective. But it's inexpensive even for Norman to consider, let alone people living in developing countries on a dollar per day. And so here we are in Cambodia. Now fortunately, we don't see people walking around Norman with uh, these physical evidences of arsenic in our water. Uh, if the arsenic level were uh, 50 to 100 times higher uh, and people were drinking the water, then you'd see arsenicosis evidence. And so in um, Cambodia, what we're doing is we're taking rice husk and we're charring it. So we're basically trying to mimic this material, which bay oxide is made by Bayer Chemical Company, a German chemical company, and it's proprietary. But we've studied it. We know what it is. Uh, and so we're trying to mimic the behavior of this material using materials in country, rice husk, charring it, and coating it with basically rust, iron oxyhydroxide, and producing a material that approaches if efficiency of this proprietary material. We, um, looking at the technology, here we have an anthropology professor, Paul Spicer, and here we have a business entrepreneurship professor in Ethiopia looking at the technical, behavioral, and uh, financial sustainability. And here's, here's Jim as well. Um, in Bolivia, Bob is doing the work on the mining impacted waters, um, and he can tell you more about that. Um, very important. Uh, Yang has already talked about his work, so um, uh, his global work and his outreach efforts. And so that's our undergraduate minor and our, um, our one pillar, our graduate research. And we have PhD students working all over the world on these topics. And our third pillar is our water prize and biennial water conference. And so here are five water prize winners every two years. It's a biennial two-year process. And so our past five prize winners and just... Uh, this fall, we selected our fifth prize winner, uh, Martha Gebehayu, and she will come next September 16th and 17th to our OU International Water Conference. We'll have upwards of 200 people from 35 countries and five, four to five continents. We'll come together and have a, a conference, and at the um, <coughs> closing ceremony, um, the prize winner will get her prize and, uh, at the banquet in, in uh, receive her um, $25,000 check and um, acknowledge her great pioneering work. So we encourage you all to come and participate that. So with that, I have three seconds left, so I'll thank you. And um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, this is in Ethiopia, this is in South Africa, and this is in Cambodia. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir.